Hello and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. In this hour, how does the U.S. election look to people from outside the U.S.? Will its ability to navigate the process show observers abroad the strength of the U.S. democracy, or will it show its weaknesses? Doug Becker explores. I'm Doug Becker. This week, the United States once again held a presidential election, one that keeps the U.S. enthralled, impassioned, frustrated, and encouraged, while also worried about outcomes. On today's show, however, we're going to draw attention to people watching and following this election outside of the United States. The U.S., it's fair to say, when it holds an election, ends up attracting more interest around the world than most, if not any other country. It might be because of American power. It might be because of the U.S.'s democratic principles, or it might simply be because of media sources and the ability to follow the American election. But on today's show, we're going to explore the view of the American election from all over the world. Our guests today are Aristotle Zampiris, Professor of International Relations and Director of the MSc Program in Energy Strategy, Law and Economics at the University of Pyrrhus. He is the author of The Emergence of Israeli-Greek Cooperation, and he joins us from Athens, Greece. Erica Resende is Assistant Professor of International Relations and Security Studies at the Brazilian War College in Rio de Janeiro. She's the co-editor of Memory and Trauma and International Relations, Theories, Cases, and Debates, and Crisis and Change in Post-Cold War Global Politics. And she is, of course, joining us from Rio de Janeiro. Simon Radford is an independent scholar based in the UK He's the co-author of Is There a Market for Peerages? Can Donations Buy You a British Peerage? A Study in the Link Between Party Political Funding and Peerage Nominations, 2005 to 2014. And he joins us from London. And Lisa Burke, a PhD candidate at the University of Denver and the author of Natural Disasters in the book, Rethinking 21st Century Security. She joins us from Victoria, British Columbia in Canada. Let's start with you, Aristotle. Um, what is the view of the US election from Greece? What are the issues that are most being followed in Greece and the perceptions you have you know, from, from where you're sitting? Thank you very much for having me again uh, on the show. I have to say that the US presidential election is getting tremendous attention in Greece once again. And uh, what people are really focusing on is basically, first, who is going to win the horse race because you have such a great cast of characters. You can't make them up, and it's really exciting. But from a a regional perspective, I think there's something else going on uh, as well. And that has to do with the fact that what the U.S. decides to do or not to do on a global level has consequences. Hence, who actually resides in the White House is something that the world has to grapple with. We'll be doing webinars and interviews in Greece, and this simply never happens when there are elections in France or in Japan, two very important countries. So in many ways, uh, Greece really looks at what happens in the US because inevitably this will influence the region where Greece is and the world as a whole. And furthermore, it's just so fascinating and so complex and so intricate And you have such characters and such media presence uh, that people, even casual uh, followers of politics, uh, just uh, really want to follow and figure out what is going on. And uh, Erica, you are in Rio, and I know Brazilian politics have had linkages to American politics, in particular in the last few years. What's your perception of what's going on in the U.S. from Rio? Thank you, Doug, for having me uh, on the show. I think it's uh, our third time here together, and I appreciate the invitation. Well, first of all, talking as ordinary Brazilian and not as much as a political scientist, I have to first acknowledge that U.S. elections is an unbelievable great telenovela. I mean, we've been here for three days long, 
staring at our um, uh, at the news channels, you know, 24/7, and watching the show with lots of speeches and the performances and the race alert. So it's very catching and exciting for an Amer for a Brazilian to try to keep up with uh, the events and as the story of who is going to be the next American president unfolds. But now talking in more as a political scientist, um, yes, there are a bunch of uh, similarities. Some of them, of course, has to do and are easily explained by history because our own political system has, when it was uh, drawn up, and the American system has always been the inspiration. So we try to, as much as possible, to reproduce some of um, uh, the U.S. political institutions. But it strikes us as very uh, confusing, such uh, what we perceive to be a very outdated model, which is the Electoral College. Because for us, the Electoral College and how it works by placing emphasis on uh, lots of, of, of small elections in each state instead of reaching out the, the list of the principle of one person, one vote. And for us, it's a very unusual system. And also the lack of a coherent legislation, federal legislation that deals with the voting process. And in the US, each state uh, manages its own uh, electoral system. So for us, that produces a very confusing, and for us, it's also very apparent the distortions that appear with this uh, particular system. And and the way that we now are falling on our, uh, you know, TV or a news cable, cable news or or, or the press or internet that keep up doing this um, comparison between the Brazilian system and the American system. And, and, and insofar as the American system has always been broadcasted, sold out, and, and narrated as the model of democracy. So uh, this is, I think, the first paradox that comes to mind. And second, I was interested, it has more to do with the particular political moment in Brazil, where our president, Jair Bolsonaro, is a huge fan of Donald Trump, uh, because both of them uh, share lots of uh, characteristics and, and, and their worldview are, have very much in common. And uh, the way that our president has openly expressed uh, his um, uh, support for a re-election of Donald Trump, and then how we, we perceive that if Biden is confirmed as president-elect, how is isolated Brazil will be in the in the in the Americas. Thank you, uh, Simon Simon Radford. This panel was partially inspired by an observation you had made that I had witnessed that could you imagine if British elections were as closely followed as American elections? The entire world knows where Maricopa County is right now. And the minutia of American voting patterns are studied in ways that other countries, even with well-established democracies like the UK, we just don't follow it that closely. So the two questions, why do you think that is? And then what, what is the perspective uh, from, from the UK in watching this American election? First of all, thank you very much for, for having me. It's great to be with my fellow panelists and, and with the audience. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how, to a certain extent, British people follow American elections in some ways much more closely than they follow our own. Uh, the, the finer details of early voting in Travis County, Texas, is somehow rather better known than um, maybe parts of Scotland, which are less well known to certain Londoners and probably vice versa to certain Scottish people in certain parts of London. So it's kind of a weird and interesting phenomenon. And it's a bit like a family argument, which all of a sudden all of the neighbors start joining in in the middle of the living room when they didn't realize they were in the house to begin with. It does seem a bit like, you know, what has this got to do with any of these people who are paying attention to it? But there are obvious reasons, obviously, for, for paying attention. And some of our other panelists, I think, have 
nailed some of the obvious ones. The one which I guess hasn't been mentioned, which I think is, is plainly true in Britain is, we're cheering on one team uh, in this. And it's fairly obvious that it's the Democrats and Joe Biden. They did a, a poll of the UK and they said that essentially if there was a constituency consi by constituency vote, i.e. Like a, like a congressional district in the UK, um, Biden would win every single constituency. So it shows that the UK is pretty divided at the moment, but it's united on one thing and that's that it wants Donald Trump to lose. And so inevitably there are people watching this a bit like everyone cheering for their own uh, sports team. I think the second thing is, you know, people want to know what Donald Trump's going to do. There's an inevitable sort of car crash, uh, meltdown, you know, is he, is he going to have a temper tantrum like a little child and, you know, refuse to leave the White House fascination? It's a bit like watching reality TV or keeping up with the Kardashians to a certain extent. And we know how popular those are. The third, I guess, is, um, is a little bit more serious, but is definitely a reason which people are interested in, which is, um, you know, Brexit hinges a little bit on who's in the White House in the sense of one of the big promises of those who favoured Brexit was there'd be a big free trade agreement with the US and it would be as good, if not better than the one we had as part of the EU. Um, Donald Trump was obviously a big fan of Brexit, but many people thought that, you know, with his views on a zero sum worldview in terms of trade, we might not get a good free trade agreement out of him. Joe Biden might be more in favor of free trade than Donald Trump, but certainly very concerned about the Irish question, considering his Irish Catholic background. So there's definite interest in terms of what the likelihood is going to be um, for Brexit, depending on who's elected. The next thing, which again, is might be maybe a bit funny for American ears, is that there's a lot of money riding on it in the UK. Our betting markets have had a huge amount of money on this election. <laughs> I think there was something saying that someone put 500,000 pounds on, on one team winning and then even Nigel Farage, who I believe is familiar to American viewers, at least of Fox News, who is the sort of enfant terrible of our Brexit party, said that he put 100,000 pounds on Trump winning. So lots of people are are cheering on the bookmakers, which is a, a new thing uh, in the UK. Um, and finally, I think the, the reason why we're, we're really watching it too is that it makes us feel better about ourselves. There's nothing quite like watching the crazy family next door to make you think that your family is relatively more sane. And while we have our kind of our own mini Trump in Boris Johnson, we certainly have from some, some similar dynamics in terms of a, a left-wing party, which is increasingly actually associated with metropolitan elites. And there's a working class revolt in terms of Brexit, which has similar echoes with Trumpianism. There's something which makes our own psychodramas seem slightly less out there when we watch the American psychodrama playing out. So yeah, as you can tell by the fact that I just think I just named about eight different things, it probably shows that there's um, many different reasons as there are people probably watching this, but everyone's very tuned in and very much everyone's pulling for uh, what they want in terms of a result, whether the money is riding on it or whether they just want their team to win. And by the way, um, something we'll circle back to is the notion of team and the notion, a couple of you said drama, but in many ways, it feels like a sporting event. And especially when thinking about things like polling and, and counting the votes and everything else. But Simon, you talked about sort of the crazy next door neighbor. So let's turn to Lisa. So of all of the countries that we have represented on today's panel, the fact that Canadians are watching this makes the most sense. I'm always reminded of the famous quip when I believe it was Pierre Trudeau, you can correct me if I'm wrong, was asked, what's it like to to share the world's largest undefended border with the United States. And his response is, what's, what's it like to sleep next to an elephant? You hope it doesn't turn over. And, um, and so I, I may have gotten that completely wrong. And if so, I will own that. But I, if not, I, I hope that's something he had said. In any case. Well, he should have said it. If he yeah, didn't, so, he should have said it. If he didn't, he should have. And Canadians have my permission to use that. But with that, Lisa, what are the Canadians watching in particular in this election? Well, there's three, four elements. One is the absolute horror of 49 million people voting for Trump and sort of scratching our heads trying to figure out how. Like, how is this gentleman who appears to check all of the anti-Canadian boxes, xenophobia, racism, sexism, blatantly so? I mean, he's not even trying it. 
Secondly, there, uh, when he was first, uh, and you know, sort of corollary to that, when he was first elected, there was an uptick in uh, hate crimes in Canada associated with it. It was almost like he gave permission for, um, for hatred, uh, you know, for things that are just not okay, including, you know, beatings and pe people being jumped because of their sexuality. Um, the other two sort of more relevant policy issues right now are COVID, because of course, Canada refuses to open the border with the US and, and our premier said in a very blunt, he's from Langford, Langford kind of way until they get their shit together. Uh, the US were not allowing any affected Americans um, over the border until they get a handle on this COVID business because they're not safe. Um, adamantly. And I don't know if that's something about the unique nature of privatized public health in the US that I, even though I live down there, could never quite grapple with. And thirdly is the, the issue of climate change. And, and related to that is jobs. Um, I'm on Vancouver Island, um, which is uh, southwest of Vancouver and has a um, and we were really nastily impacted by the forest fires, worse than I think parts of LA were in some ways, because um, our, our air was the worst, uh, like it was maxed out all over the island and I have severe asthma and couldn't leave the house. So, you know, not, yay COVID, yay mask, yay, yay forest fires. You know, it was like this vector of all these things coming together. And the other thing is the ongoing tra trade wars, even if Biden, wins and you know that it's looking like it um he's talking about buying american and reconstructing the u.s based economy in an insular way what is this going to mean for free trade what is this going to mean for the free flow of goods um which and there are significant supply chain problems because of covid hmm. because there there is a you know there is a woman the ferry that the island is connected to the mainland by a giant ferry hmm. and um well i call it giant but it is pretty big and uh, she refused to wear a mask because, you know, Trump said so. And, you know, and they, uh, they, RCMP came and hauled her off, but it delayed the, you know, very well run mechanisms of the, of the ferry. You know, there's this whole conspiracy theory that's, that's gotten its, you know, nits and nuts in here and is just be, a term I just made up and you can all coin it. But, um, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's really weird. Like we get inundated with American TV and American news and American so much so that they started the CRTC. So if American media is going to be so uh, obsessed with, you know, this pizza factory or a pizza store in Brooklyn as a basis of a political movement. You know, what is this going to say mean for what it means to be Canadian, which when I was living down there, I used to joke, well, at least, you know, we're not American. That's, that's all we know. That's how you define Canadians. We're not American. You're listening to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. We're discussing the American election and the view of this election from outside of the U.S., from countries abroad. Just as a as a quick side note, you said you couldn't imagine how 49 million people, you know, could have voted for Donald Trump. And it's actually slightly over 69 million. So your numbers uh, is a little bit short and it's going to end up being over 70, certainly, uh -huh. as we're counting it. So now, Aristotle, you had made an observation earlier this week about polling, because one thing we've all kind of followed the polls in the U.S. and regardless of how this turns out, it's there's certainly been some deficiencies in polling. Does that have international uh, implications as well, or is that pretty much perceived as American polling is kind of failing, but it really hasn't had the same sort of an effect, you know, for instance, across Europe? First of all, let's say that uh, the polling, the political polling profession has yet, uh, once again, not had its finest moment, not even close to it. My favorite example is the Washington Post ABC poll of Wisconsin. Their final poll showed Biden winning the state by 17 points. It's closer to 0.5, less than 1%. He is winning. He's going to win it. But 17 to 0.5 is very close to a professional meltdown. And uh, what you see is that uh, even when it came to the national uh, electorate, the popular vote, uh, they were routinely uh, predicting uh, 10 points, 7 points. It's probably going to be three to five at the most. 
So they got who's going to be first. But heck, you know what? A lot of people could have done that without spending millions. So this is something troubling. And I think it's actually not something that is U.S. based only. We, we've seen uh, in many countries polls failing. There are many examples. Brexit is one. Uh, a lot of polls didn't get it uh, right. Most of them did not get it right. We want to go back. I mean, there, there are many examples. And I think that uh, there's uh, an issue. There's an issue that has to do with models and whom do you actually poll. But I think there are deeper changes going on. I'm just thinking about myself. If someone called me at 7.30 or 8 p.m. and said, do you want to spend half an hour talking about what you're going to vote for? Uh, you know, my kids have to go to bed. I'm busy. And I'm a political scientist. I'm a hardcore political animal. So I think there are uh, deeper changes going on, trying to figure out who's going to vote, um, trying to get uh, the correct sample. You've got internet-based questions. You've got phone calls. You have the traditional interview. It is becoming, in our day and age, we're inundated by social media. Attention spans are shorter and shorter. We have people who are actually angry, and that has to do with globalization or inequality, other reasons, and very distrustful of the political process, the political class, and pollsters. And I think all that is going to have as an effect uh, less trust in polls, rest, less trust in the system, and polling is going to become far more difficult. And that's not necessarily good for a democracy, both the level of distrust and the fact that you can't get it right. So you, you might not be clear about where the country or any country is standing. So these are troublesome uh, trends. Now, it, it is going to be the case that uh, in the end, Nate Silver will say, well, you know, I said Trump has a 10% chance of winning. He lost. So I was uh, on the money. But in reality, it's a little bit more complex than that. And I'm worried about it. I'm really worried. And it's very important for, especially in important states like the United States, still the most powerful country in the world, if politicians do not have a clear picture of how people are thinking because of a variety of reasons, then they have their gut feeling or maybe their uh, ideology. But that's something that you don't want to miss from the decision-making process. So I'm very worried about this. And I'm actually not happy that in two successive presidential elections, uh, the polling profession has not done a, a great job. Now, Aristotle, you raised an interesting point as well as, as far as the influence of, of the United States in that when you speak of the polling profession, so many pollsters from around the world get their training in the U.S. or have connections with the U.S. And so if the U.S. is getting it wrong, it makes sense that other countries are also getting it wrong. So that's certainly the level of concern you have for that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, now, Erica, I know from the perspective of sort of the tactics of running a campaign, the, the, the types of campaigns, the use of social media, the use of language, et cetera, that in Brazil, that's been something that's been, been highlighted, that Jared Bolsonaro was very Trumpian, not just potentially ideologically, but very much politically, tactically. How is the the way in which the elections are conducted in the U.S. having an impact on how elections, the, the actual tactics that are used, the elections being conducted in Brazil? We are one week away from elections in Brazil. Sunday, there are going to be elections uh, for uh, mayor's office and city councils around the, the, the country. Um, because we have elections every two years, two years as well. So, um, in terms of, if you want to pull a comparison between U.S. electoral campaigning and and in Brazil, I would say that um, polls do not matter as much as it seems to matter in the American um, elections, and I think. Although I'm not a great specialist on polling, so I have to acknowledge that, but from my understanding, polling in Brazil have not made the, the huge mistakes that I can, as I can see in the American elections in, in, in the last two uh, presidential elections in the US. Um, but what I do see about um, 
the way campaigns are run is that Bolsonaro, I, he uh, embraces the same tactics regarding the use of uh, social uh, media uh, and the use of fake news, WhatsApp and robots, uh, you know, sending messages and misinformation. That particular tactics, I think it's, uh, it plays the same here. It play, and it is increasingly uh, playing. Although I have to acknowledge that for this year's election in Brazil, the Supreme Court of Electoral System, we have one of those. <laughs> it's a court that's specialized on election. It's not um, a permanent court. It's established and and it worked with uh, borrowed members from Supreme Court and two different kinds of uh, federal court, higher court. And uh, they only deal with accusations of uh, and misuse of campaign money, things like that. And uh, for this year, the electoral Supreme Court has had a very harsh policy of trying to stop and limit misinformation, fake news. And they went as far as, for example, to sit down with uh, the heads of uh, uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, Google, and all others, trying to come up with rules regarding mass spread and, and of, of uh, messages and things like that. Uh, so, for example, WhatsApp, which is an app, the most used app in Brazil for texting. N uh, since last year, it has been uh, uh, blocked. You cannot send messages more than, uh, I think, it's six or eight people at one time. So, it is an attempt to uh, block the political of spread for spreading fake news and, and misinformation. Um, one thing that um, I think it's, it's very interesting to acknowledge regarding coal, although uh, I haven't seen that much in Brazil regarding, you know, electoral procedures, but fully regarding other issues for, for policy making, is Bolsonaro has, in a way, forced us people who work in the, you know, political scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, to acknowledge how um, right, how, how much of a right-wing, racist, misogynist uh, uh, Brazilians are. And that is one thing that now it's showing up in, in fully, if you, if you may, conduct polls, for example, regarding abortion. People are embarrassed to admit how, you know, misogynic and, and racist they are. So one thing that I, I think is what's playing in the U.S., as well as, in, for example, in the Brexit example, uh, is uh, people are not acknowledging how, you know, so much to the right and, the, and they become. And so they like For example, polls in Brazil regarding, do you are you a racist or have you used the racist language? And people say, no, not at all. But then it's looking to, uh, for example, people who, who say, oh, I have no problem with uh, LGBT people. I think they deserve to be, uh, to have equal rights. But then if you look into, have you ever discriminated against? No, not at all. Although everybody thinks that have, they, they have to discriminated uh, in their life. So one thing that uh, polling, uh, if you think about polling, then this move to the right in certain countries, uh, like the US, Brazil, Hungary, or Turkey, is people are embarrassed to admit their political standing, and so they lie for polling. And this is one factor that polling experts, professionals, have worked they, their way through. I don't know how, but that so that they need to do this job for uh, if they want to improve their pollings and, and we need them. We need them not only for 
who's going to win in a particular election for who we, even if you we want to know and 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 to be able to gather data for mining policies for example absolutely when we come back what are the unique traits of american democracy and just how democratic are they stay with us This is the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. The United States is struggling through a difficult election. Will its ability to navigate the process show observers abroad the strength of the U.S. democracy, or will it show its weaknesses? Doug Becker explores. Simon, I'm thinking, you know, in the U.K., you've got a system that's similar, at least to the notion of congressional districts. You've got you know, constituencies that are based on residents. So at some level, the feature of territory in American elections would make sense. But do you have difficulty explaining the Electoral College and that justification? And, and is there a perception that's a, um, that's a democracy deficiency? The fact that the U.S. has this uh, institution that I as an American sometimes struggle to explain to my own students? Yeah, I think I think if you asked most most Brits on the street what's the electoral college, they probably wouldn't have a clue. Um, you ask what well, ask them what an unfaithful elector is, and they they don't know what that is. Um, you know, I, th- I think, but it's one of many things I think which people think are um, deficient or weird uh, when it look when you look at American democracy, and 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 the irony, of course, being that America is meant to be this shining city on a hill, promoting democracy to the rest of the world. Um, sort of rankles all the more for these things. The the most obvious thing is just the sheer amount of money in American politics. Now, campaign finance reform is one of those topics that was super hot in the 90s, along with, you know, grunge music and various other things. And it seems like no one talks about it anymore. But I mean, I think both sides spent over a billion dollars on this thing. Now, in, in Britain, when you're running for parliament in your local constituency, you know, you normally have about 10 people in a raincoat and about a thousand pounds or something to spend on on leaflets and people go door to door and put them through your letterbox. It's a very homespun thing. And there's a, there's a reason for why that's a great thing. One, it doesn't, you know, it wastes less money, I think, on this. Two, it, it allows people who are independent or people who have a point of view to participate in the process as candidates um, in, a, in a more meaningful way than, than um, they do where this kind of gilded class are the only people who can afford to actually sort of participate in a meaningful way. I mean, thirdly, also, there's less worries, although, of course, there are worries, and I've written a paper about this myself, which you quoted at the beginning, that donors get preferential treatment when it comes to um, special interests and various things. Of course, that happens everywhere, but when Michael Bloomberg is dropping $100 million in a losing effort in Florida, you have to ask, why is he doing it, and what does he get out of it? And so the Electoral College seems to be just a, a kind of a tip of the iceberg, and you know, whether it's in Britain, normally, you know, the result by four o'clock the next morning. Um, clearly, we're, we're taping this when we don't know necessarily what the result is yet. Um, so the Electoral College, money and politics, the fact that every state seems to have its own rules, the fact that Nebraska and Maine seem to have its own rules from everyone else. Why Nebraska and Maine? I mean, um, seems a bit odd. Uh, so there's, there's lots of things which I think are a bit odd to, to British ears and eyes. But frankly, I think if Americans step back and think about it, it's probably a bit weird to them too. And yet somehow, because it's the way it's always been done, uh, and because it's so hard to change, there's never been a huge movement to change it. And I wonder whether that's something which, when we think about restoring faith in institutions and restoring faith in government and restoring faith in Washington, D.C., whether the party that stands to gain the most from that should probably make a central plank of their prospectus making the absurdities slightly less absurd. Uh, and I think that has to start with, with money and politics and, and thinking more about what the real sort of Jeffersonian idea of democracy is, of people being able to participate in a more bottom-up democratic way rather than uh, a kind of more Russian oligarchic approach with um, some rich billionaires and millionaires dropping huge checks in order to try and influence elections. 
by the way, um, just to point out, you say there's never really been much of a move to try to eliminate the Electoral College, but there actually was a pretty strong political move in the late 70s or early 80s, I believe it was 1979, led by, uh, by an Indiana senator, Birch Bayh, and came very, very close to eliminating it. How was it fail? That unique American institution of the filibuster. <laughs> and so something else that certainly a kind of weirdness, at least at a minimum, if not a democracy a deficit. Erica, do you have a, a quick comment you want to make about that? When Carmen was talking about how to explain the Electoral College to um, Britain, and this happened to me two days ago. I sat down with my mother, she's 84, and I tried to explain her how, what was going on, what is the like, you know, electoral um, college system. The thing that she remarked, and because she picked it up like instantly, is that, oh, I do understand, so each state has a certain amount of votes. So, am I correct to assume that then people who live in Alaska, Wyoming, Nevada have very, with fewer votes in it, they don't matter. So uh, that perception of her, of how important, for example, one state with 20 votes like Pennsylvania matters more than a little state like Alaska with only three. So I think for uh, someone who is not familiar with the American system, that's what really strikes as very unusual and undemocratic to begin with. Absolutely. Aristotle, first. I'll ask Aristotle and then come back to Lisa. Very quickly, I have lots of fun with my uh, first year student. I asked them, who elects a US president? They say the people, and I say, you're wrong. It's not the people, it's the electoral college. And I have to agree with Simon that it's extremely difficult to change it. But other things have changed in the US uh, constitution. And it's clearly not very democratic. It's an 18th century institution it's constitutional, of course, but how many times does the word democracy appear in the Constitution? None. So it's, it's indicative of a certain fr uh, framework uh, of thinking about politics. But I want to be a little bit more contrarian. It's the United States of America. A persistent theme in the United States are regional differences. It's a state-federal system, for better or worse. And the fact that we're talking about Maricopa country, or a congressional district in Maine or Nebraska that could be the tipping point in the electoral college. This system allows states to be relevant. Why? Because candidates have to go to states, uh, listen to them, pay attention. It's, a, it's not, no one can argue that it's particularly democratic, but from a state point of view, it's very important because otherwise you would have candidates camp out uh, outside uh, 16 or 20 big metropolitan areas and that would be it. So I just, and I think that's one of the reasons that it hasn't been uh, changed for uh, two and a half centuries, because it allows smaller states, rural states to uh, potentially play a significant role. Now, I'm not saying whether this is good or bad. I'm, I'm more trying to explain the persistence of this very unusual, unique 18th century electoral institution. Now, there is one, one quick thing that I'm going to ask Lisa this as well. Another factor that gives these states this practice, because we've only been focused on the, on the national election, is the nomination process and the way in which the candidates have to go state by state by state. And one factor, I, I literally delivered two lectures about this this week, is the fact they start in Iowa which is an absolute homage to agricultural policy and rural policy, regardless of where the candidate is from or what their motivations are. They have a farm policy and they certainly have knowledge, especially when it comes to Iowa. Frequently spent a year in Iowa going from county to county to county. I don't know of any other industrial democracy that has anything that resembles the length of the, of the nomination process and the minutia that goes into, in particular, these early small states like Iowa and New Hampshire. Lisa, I'll ask you, first of all, about the Electoral College, the view from up north, but also any of these issues about regionalism. Canada is a big country. It's a really big country. And yes, size does matter, to quote the arrogant worms. Here's a Canadian folk song, folk group. They also did a song called Carrot Juice's Murder Toot. But um, 
<laughs> They're brilliant. Anyway, as an aside, I'll speak about the regional issues first, and then I'll move into the electoral colleges because they kind of blend it. my response to Aristotle and also um, the regional. So how Canada, Canada is a bigger country with less population so, um, than the U.S. is. It's as I was told by one gentleman in Denver, um, Canada is bigger than China and has fewer people than Texas. Um, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I, yeah. Anyway, it's it's it always amazes me how little how little geographic knowledge people have. Um, so, uh, how Canada has resolved this is with the bicameral system. So we have one house based on the House of Commons based on population, and then we have the the Senate, which is based on geography theoretically, with Quebec holding up uh, more of its fair share. Um, oddly, uh, the First Nations aren't yet institutionalized in the Canadian government. I'm anticipating at some point they might be, or I'm moving to that. They are considered a third arm of government and an independent country because it's mostly not ceded. So a lot of Canada doesn't exist under international law. They're using a Captain Cook Treaty. Um, and so like uh, in Quebec, I think it's only Quebec City itself that has been ceded. So, and bits of Montreal, but not a lot else. Um, and where I live in BC, it's particularly a, a paramount. So every time you go to a government meeting or a government function, they give homage to the unceded territory of the Salish or the, um, the Nootka or, whom, or wherever you happen to be located. Um, so there, there are ways to resolve the tension between population and in Canada language um, compounded off, quite often by religion. So it's the, the tension between the Catholics and the Protestants. Um, and uh, the and geography, like how to account for something that's both reparable, you know, like democratic and representative. Um, the electoral college um, is portrayed up here as something to keep w rich white dudes in power, basically. It was an attempt to answer the, you know, uh, Aristotle's question about how do you keep a, a democracy from devolving into uh, a mob? or the rule of the demos and, you know, like bastardizing itself. And so you do that with a sober second opinion in a way that's got a stranglehold and no balance to it, which is the question in, I have for an organization that's so focused on checks and balances, what balances the electrical college? You're listening to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. We're discussing the American election and the American electoral system from the view of, uh, from around the world. My last question is kind of a big question though, so and I'll start with, with Aristotle. The challenge that the U.S. faces right now in this election, the fact it's certainly taking a long time, it's exposed certain aspects that call, you know, some democratic principles, you know, into question, etc. The fact that the U.S. is almost assuredly going to navigate this one, you know, perhaps with some, some difficulties, but it's going to survive it. Is this a sign, the fact the U.S. is having difficulty uh, and has had difficulty the last few elections you know, with managing the election and, and questions about legitimacy, does this undermine the notion of the U.S. as a real democratic leader? Or is the fact that it's actually navigating it pretty well show the strength of the system and one that's likely to build its, its image as a democratic country around the world? Oh, it's a great question. Uh, first of all, I think the world has noticed the following, that uh, participation in this election has risen as a percentage of the population. Probably you haven't had a higher participation in more than a century. So this is an indication of the vibrancy of American democracy in the 21st century. And the fact that voting has been made uh, easier uh, and because it was made easier, more people voted, which is a net plus and gain for democracy. I think a lot of countries around the world are taking a close look at that. Uh, and I think that is something very, very positive. So, uh, for example, uh, I'd say that the fact that the United States very infamously uh, had an election day that was a working day uh, didn't help voting. But now uh, uh, it's showing the way of how you can increase voter turnout in the 21st century. At the same time, it's 
absolutely clear to me and to the world that uh, the United States remain, remains a very polarized country. Even as seems likely at this point, Biden wins the election, it's not going to be a landslide. This is a society that's polarized. And I think that this polarization doesn't necessarily or only have to do with a very uh, divisive character like Donald Trump, but I think it has to do with uh, greater forces, democratic and financial. I list the following. First, the United States is going through a democratic, a demographic, excuse me, uh, sea change. Uh, by 2040, uh, whites in the United States will not be the majority. And I think this is dawning upon people. They're changing demographics of the most important country in the world. And then the tremendous inequality. It's the kind of inequality that raises eyebrows. And I think that people are really living through times of uh, great inequality. And when that happens and you see yourself falling behind, uh, then uh, I think you uh, search for scapegoats or explanations or solutions. And that I think causes a lot of this uh, vibrancy and participation, but also polarization and conflict. The demographics, inequality linked to globalization and uh, the fact that more, most, more people are participating, these are things that are not unique just to the United States. Uh, and especially inequality is something that we can see in the 21st century across the West. So I think these are things that uh, American democracy is dealing with imperfectly. Let me also very quickly say that it's the, the United States is unique in the sense that you elect a president, elect, and then he has the time for a transition. Uh, in uh, parliamentary democracies, you win an election and you probably have 48 hours to form a government and not in the United States. So that gives a cushion to the electoral process to uh, play out. You can have lawsuits. In fact, this election is probably going to uh, be decided in a very American fashion through litigation. But I think that the United States is on the forefront of all these changes and it's, they're being played out on a larger um, uh, scene and uh, on a larger stage. And the world is paying great attention and I think a lot of what we see in the United States, we'll see in other countries, uh, hopefully uh, in a less uh, divisive or uh, conflictual uh, manner. Erica, I guess part of the issue is going to be whether or not we see political violence in the United States, or if this is all managed through peaceful mechanisms, and also perhaps through, through lawsuits. But with that in mind, um, is the polarization and the challenges that, that we're seeing faced in, in American elections, is the fact that it's likely to be managed without conflict a, a sign of the, the strength of American democracy and the image it, it, it projects uh, around the world? Or is this showing a real sort of weakness as the U.S. projects itself as, as a democratic leader? Well, depends on what you mean by violence. I, when I watched Donald Trump yesterday, for me, that was violent. The way he went on on conspiracy theories of fraud, legal votes, illegal votes, that for me was violent. Not violence in terms of blood getting spilled, but it was violent. The way and the, during the, I think it was in the first debate when he refused to condemn white supremacist group, for me that was violent. So I think that American politics which it's not surprising because it has been in a buildup of, of, of politics, a, base, a politics based on fear. It has already become violent. So uh, what I will, as a question, you know, get it back to you, it depends on what you mean by violence. Because when I see the, you know, bodies of black people being shot by the police all over America, for me, that's already violence out there. And so, and again, you know, as Lisa, you know, very correctly pointed out, 60, 60 million people voting for Trump, for me, that's violence. That's a huge, America has surpassed what, or, or even, you know, crossed a, a, a very strong, threshold of saying that we are not um, 
if ever we were trying to build up this American dream or melt, uh, melting pot, as well, however you want to narrate it and represent it as, as being out welcoming, tolerant, diversity, I already see, you know, America coming through its team. Simon, you know, with the same question with Great Britain, I'm reminded of the great Churchillian quote that the Americans will always do the right thing, but after they've tried everything else. Is that sort of the, the view from Great Britain, or do we just make the mistake of always attributing uh, any Churchillian quote to a common British approach to the U.S.? Is this election, what, what kind of impact is it having on British perceptions and other international perceptions on the U.S.? I'm not sure the election itself moves the dial compared to the last four years in general. I think sort of people's views on the United States are pretty baked in at this point, especially at the America under Trump. I think there's also an, an easy way of both saying that sort of reasons to think that this is very similar to other episodes in American past and therefore not to overreact, and equally reasons to think that this might be the, the start of something slightly different. Right? I mean, I think, I think you don't need to be a scholar of American history to, to think back to you know, RFK being shot during the nomination process in 68 or to George Wallace getting, getting shot. Um, there's been a huge amount of, of real American violence in terms of assassinations and killings um, throughout its history um, in a way that actually is not very common in other countries. I mean, I think you know, most people probably can't name one British politician who's been um, shot apart from the recent one in terms of Brexit and, and I think Spencer Percival at some point in the 18th century. Um, so, so I think there's sort of a, a dangerous thing thinking that maybe this is more unusual than it is. The, the reason why I think um, people might think it's a bit different is, you know, the stripped down definition in political science of, of um, democracy is that elites rotating in power. And I think to a certain extent, what we're seeing with, uh, with Donald Trump is this idea of it not being elites rotating in power, but elites um, stealing elections from the people. And that's the frame that's trying to be substituted. And I think when that happens, it is slightly more dangerous, that it becomes less of, a, um, of, an, of an organized set of Queensbury rules, which parties participate in, and something which is a much more bare-knuckled um, struggle for power. Uh, a video which I saw recently was George H.W. Bush conceding the race to Clinton in 1992. And you'll struggle to, to hear a more you know, gracious speech where he concedes, he congratulates Clinton on running a great campaign and promises to do everything he can to make Bill Clinton's presidency a success. That's the sort of Queensbury rules in action. And that's not something which you're seeing in this election and won't see um, while Donald Trump's around. And he's, there's a political culture that he's created, which means that that's unlikely to come back anytime soon. And I think that's what worries people. And then finally, the thing which is obviously very different in 2020 compared to 1968 is, is the ability to mobilize people quickly. So yes, you'll, you'll say historically, America's always had its yellow press, people saying horrible things about Andrew Jackson's wife or what have you. Um, but there was a, you know, a group on Facebook advocating for, for civil war, which had to be taken down, which raises, um, you know, sort of quite, quite large questions about, is this something which can get unraveled on the basis of mass mobilization at the click of a button, as opposed to a, a previous thing where coordination, is that just that much more difficult? So even when there's been a very coarse political culture, the ability for the, the sort of institutions to protect themselves was that much greater. Now the barriers to overcome for people who wish to tear it down are that much lower and their ability to coordinate like-minded people is, is that much easier. But I think people are worried that this time might be different. So I think there's good reasons to both look to the past for hope, but also be very vigilant about things which we need to keep an eye on if it's going to actually get through this period as America's done before. Now, Lisa, we only have about a minute left. So give a quick response the question. Yeah, no, I'm just saying two things. One, I think what Trump is really um, surfacing is, is one, uh, you know, is it the ultimate uh, trajectory of American political life where unless everything is litigated to the nth degree, then um, it's norms are occluded from political life. So it's like it has to be spelled out in the letter of the law in order for it to be real. And secondly, um, 
uh, what impact does um, changing forms of communication technologies have? You know, we're, we're governing by tweets. We're governing by short, short snippets rather than le leave it lengthy and rational discourse. What impact does that have on the political mind and political space? I think it's a great place to end considering the importance of the election, the importance of the messaging, uh, uh, the way in which this is playing itself out, and uh, a reminder to we Americans that the world is watching and the impacts this can have on global democratization, on conflict resolution, on individual rights, human rights uh, questions, et cetera, always have a, a significant impact. Part of being an American is to assert that you're really important and it's extremely important for Americans to remember that you are and your actions carry, and our actions carry certain, carry messages and carry meanings. We've been discussing today the impact of the American election on the views from around the world and the perceptions from scholars from all over the world on American political developments. Our panel today has been Aristotle Zampiris, Professor of International Relations and the Director of the MSc Program on Energy, Strategy, Law and Economics at the University of Pyrrhus. He's the author of The Emergence of Israeli-Greek Cooperation and joins us from Athens. Erica Resende is the Assistant Professor of International Relations and Security Studies at the Brazilian War College in Rio de Janeiro. She is the co-editor of Memory and Trauma in International Relations and Crisis and Change in Post-Cold War Global Politics. Simon Radford is an independent scholar based in London in the UK and the co-author of Is There a Market for Peerages? Can Donations Buy You a British Peerage? And Lisa Burke, PhD candidate at the University of Denver and the author of Natural Disasters in Rethinking 21st Century Security. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our guests and to you for listening. The Scholars Circle team includes Doug Becker and Lillian Inc., contributing hosts, Ankine Arasian and Melissa Chiprin, managing producers, Sud Dongre, our webmaster, Tim Page and Mike Hurst, engineers and technical support. I'm Maria Armudian, and we'll see you next week.